this evening we are <clears throat> this evening we're going to play on uh, three ideas similar to an analogy and what is sometimes called essence behind the word essence is the Greek word usia so I'm going to be using this word usia when I refer to it now this curious game of philosophy, the kind of philosophy that we are exploring, has a very interesting relationship between experience uh, reflection discovering a language and it feeds back upon itself. What's quite amazing about this kind of philosophy is that given a profound, therefore, experience of one kind or another, to the degree to which it's unusual, out of the ordinary, it brings a person to reflect on that experience. To the degree that it's markedly different than their everyday experience, they have to find some way of reflecting upon it and this forces them to use language in a new way. So they build a kind of vocabulary. And that vocabulary is, then goes back on their reflections and improves their reflections. And that may in fact bring them again to another insight, perhaps into another experience which in turn goes back and forth, one way to the other. There are some very clear examples of this, of course, in the Platonic tradition. Proclus, Plotinus. Therefore, it's quite dynamic. It's quite dynamic. Because what occurs is, as these experiences become more profound, through life reflection obviously becomes more serious to the individual and the vocabulary could then develop greater precision. And when you develop more precision, then you begin to do something. You begin to do something rather strange. The reflections bring a level of intelligibility to the experience. Makes the, makes the language and the vocabulary and the reflection more intelligible. And when discovers in the experience the possibility of even more profound experiences. We need one more thing, which is very curious. And that is, as the experiences and the reflections and the vocabulary grow into levels of profundity, there's an increased insight into something that goes against the heart of most of our education. That is, one begins to build a, an appreciation, an appreciation, a sympathy, for systems 
that share the same elements. That is to say, it it's naturally becomes important to compare, to compare experiences, reflections, and language, and the development of how this language comes together into an intelligible whole. Therefore, it's only natural, therefore, that this experience, reflection, and language has one thing in mind. How to find something common to preserve, to preserve, to purify, <clears throat> and in that sense, to protect kind of a protect one's insights because it had a great it had a great um, uplifting purifying force that one wants naturally to preserve either in language or in one's reflections because the more profound obviously the more vital it becomes and that whole process depends upon one curious thing being possible. And that is a growing realization that one can uh, grasp the nature of oneself as uh, essential to the reality we inhabit, of which we are part and parcel. Ah. Because the more profound experiences you get are not into chewing gum. It's a growing realization that one can grasp the nature of oneself on more profound levels. That very thought, you see, as you reflect upon it, means in some way that at one time you were, to put it in one sense, asleep to what you were, to what you are, and through this curious kind of play between experience, reflection, and language, can wake up to a more profound idea of one's own identity. What does that mean? That means then that as the more profound experiences are open to man, in the same way, their insight into themselves is the same thing. They're good heavens, they're either the same thing or they must be quite similar. And the language and the reflection that one brings to it must bear some similarity to both the experiences and the unfolding insights into oneself. So therefore, good heavens, levels of experience, reflections upon it, the language, there, there is a certain basic similarity going on. And therefore, the whole question is, what is the nature of this similitude? Now, similitude, I mean by that, is that there's some sameness between two things or two persons. Because it looks like that's the very nature of the way man functions as he experiences and reflects and builds a language. 
Now this is true in every experience, from surfing to mysticism. The more profound the experience is, the more they reflect, the more the language develops appropriate to it. That brings one, therefore, to understand more fully the experience. One's reflection grows, one's language develops peculiar to the range of experience. So we're not saying anything that everyone certainly wouldn't agree to. But I'd like to take a moment on similar to it. Now, there's one thing we need to use in order to play See, we're brought up to hold to the notion that all ideas are abstractions. Lifeless things, lifeless things, mere words, nothing behind them, and nominalism. But we're into a different system, you see. What we're into is saying, no, on the contrary, causes, there are causes, they're causes of experiences. They're causes of our reflections. And these causes may be that we're, more, we're participating more fully into ideas that have a vitality of their own and intelligibility of their own and a being of their own. Such an idea I would like to introduce, and that's the idea of similitude. And you'll see. Right? Notice the way in which they approach it. This comes out of Proclus. What is similitude for Proclus? See, for similitude itself, it's talking about an idea. Similitude itself by itself, what does it do? It conducts and binds. That's what it does, right? It's like a thing, it is a thing, it has a being, right? It has a being. It conducts and binds the many to one. Oh. Oh. Let's see if we can talk about the word similitude in a different way. All right, here, let me try it. I'm going to say if the condition for something does not exist, the thing could not participate in existence. The conditions for something are prior to the thing itself, or the thing being inquired about. The conditions are prior to the subject. Or activity. Therefore, let me just take this idea of similitude and put it into Plato's Timaeus for a moment. Here is the Demiorgos, God maker, and as an idea, and just one idea. It's a simultaneous whole. It's a whole of all wholes. It's a unity of unities. And that's the model for creating the universe. I should call it the cosmos. As Plato says in the time is, the demiurgos then reflecting upon himself, the model produces the copy. That's a similitude, see, something similar between these two things. Therefore, the whole idea of an idea being in the mind of God that creates the universe presupposes a certain condition must be be present, and that is the condition for similitude. If the condition for similitude are not possible, then we couldn't have a model copy anywhere, including creation. 
That's why in the time is he says, um, this is the supreme originating principle of the universe. Likeness. Likeness is the supreme principle. Because the idea of similitude asserts that something has already been accomplished, that is, a similarity between two things. The condition for a similarity is the idea of likeness being present. If the idea of likeness weren't present, or the condition for likeness uh, were eliminated, if the conditions for a likeness were not fulfilled, then obviously there could be no model copy generated. Therefore, the idea of likeness, see, the idea for likeness has some kind of existence. These conditions have some kind of existence. They have some kind of vitality. So look here, going back. For similitude itself by itself conducts and binds the many to one. For there to be a similarity between these two, a similitude between these two things, there must be something between the two that is the same. Well, then that's a bond. <clears throat> that's a bond. It connects. Connects. As father to son. So now... It does not only connects, it has an interesting power which is central to the whole discussion and, uh, and really essential to all of Plato. We're used to the one, we need the other. This is the overflowing, this is creation. This is progression. There's a return. There is a return. This return, this return sometimes is called converts. So therefore, in the unfolding of the universe, the progression into the cosmos, then the condition must necessarily follow for a return. That return, therefore, is understood in a variety of ways. One way is that what the return is, is to the good. Since all beings want to grasp the nature of the good, and, the, uh, and seek goodness in anything they do, no matter what they're doing, they're always seeking something they desire because it's good. The ultimate good for which all men seek is the good itself. Therefore, the condition of the good itself is the very condition for converting. Because whatever is generated here becomes naturally attracted to something it perceives as good. Taking that to an ultimate term, then these things then naturally desire contact and communion with their source. So therefore, similitude itself conducts and binds the many to the one and converts, you see, secondary natures to the monads or the unity, which must exist prior to them. Therefore, you know what this says? For this to take place, therefore, for this to take place, we know what we need now. We need another term, don't we? For a progression and a return, well, <laughs> the conditions for that Obviously, the conditions for that must precede and come prior to it. Therefore, the idea of unity must be in place as the condition for the entire creation and return. Or unity or oneness right? as a vital idea having its own existence. This we can change the name of and call a monad. Because, look at there. For similitude itself by itself conducts and binds the many to the one and converts secondary natures to the monads prior to them. Ah. Now, watch what he's doing. 
for the very being of similars, whatever is similar, so far as they are similar, is derived from the one. The very being of anything that is similar must necessarily be, to the degree to which things are similar, must participate in, and the conditions for their existence must be the one. To the degree that any two things are similar to that degree, they more and more they become uh, necessarily approximate the one itself, of which they are both similar. Now look here. Now we can reflect back. Can we possibly now reflect? Remember what we are doing before? We are saying experience invites reflection and that generates a language. So now we are taking this as our particular idea. We have been introduced to it. It is a kind of intellectual experience we are having. Now we want to see whether we can reflect on what we just did and come up with a new language. Say, if this is true, well, it conjoins, hey look here, this unity, you know what it does? It conjoins, doesn't it? It conjoins the multitude, the many things, right? From which it is allotted its progression. Right? It conjoins that multitude. It brings them together. It, the progression brought them scattered into the multiplicity. Return, why the idea of unity conjoins them to that from which it had it, its source or its progression. Hey, if that's true, look here, if that's true, look here, if that's true, look what we can conclude. On this account, similitude is, is, is that which it is causing many things to be allied, similar, uh, to possess sympathy with one another, with themselves, and friendship with each other, that's what similitude does, and akin to the one. Therefore, the idea of similitude it reflects a natural goodness. It reflects a natural goodness. Hmm. Now, we need to explore this the stage, a little with a little more precision, we're going to get some more terms. We need some more terms. And we need to reflect upon more about the conditions for these things we've just been talking about, which is luckily enough why we have another page. Okay, now let's go back to the idea of similar to it. Very interesting idea. What's the condition for similar to it? Well, if this is something and this is something else, they overlap. To this degree, we can say that overlapping is the similitude. And if we can say there's a string of them, each connected, then each particular thing is linked and it's possible to link them because there must be something about each of these two elements, A and B, inherently that allows them to cross, to bind, to blend, like colors. There has to be some property about them which allows them. Otherwise, things would be like this. No connection, separated. So if there is a progression, it proceeds through similitude. There must be something similar to them. Or we can represent it this way. A. All right. Uh, let's not use that. Let, let's use um, unlettered for a moment. If we have two things and we want to see whether there's a progression between one and the other, we have to find something there that is similar to both. And if we can't find it, there'll be a vacuum. The idea of progression metaphysically means no vacuum. There always must be a mean term between two extremes. There must always be a mean term 
between others. In this case, we can say extreme if we want. Therefore, first principle progression by similitude, no vacuum. Therefore, there must be some, as in this case, some participation. There must be some participation. If there's participation, there must be contact, unfoldment. So sure enough, what does that contact and participation do? There has to be a communion, see? There has to be a communion. For all contact and participation brings about a communion of things that are conjoined. Now these two are conjoined, made possible by the third term, which is a mean. And it can only be joined because there must be something essentially about those things that allows it possible to be conjoined. But once conjoined, there's a sympathy. See, there's a sympathy of participations with the natures that are participated. Therefore, there's a kinship. This brings a kinship. There's a kinship. And therefore, that's the heart of friendship, finding some mean between two people they don't know one another. They have to find something similar. Once they find a basis for similarity, they can then share things. They can then experience one another in a different way. They can then allow themselves to reflect upon that similarity and develop a common language within which to express their relationship. So therefore, it allows a sympathy of participants. Okay, what does that do? That converts, doesn't it? That converts. That brings people together. Brings them through makes them turn about and come together. Without similitude, therefore, no progression, no generation, gaps, no connections. Now, let's take three ideas and <clears throat> talk about them. Um, What I need to see is in the progression necessarily of these things, what we are agreeing to by accepting this model is that in a set of progressions, it must follow that similars come before dissimilars. Prior to. Prior to dissimilars. That's what that progression means. That means then, whenever we have a progression, it must follow that there is something about this, if it has the qualities X and Y, then through that kinship, it's going to pass those qualities on. Therefore, there must necessarily always be, in terms of the progeny of anything produced, qualities which bear a close likeness to the very thing that is generated. Okay? There must be a likeness. Must be a likeness. And the greater the likeness, the greater the extent of its of its effect. The greater the likeness, the greater extent of its effects. That's what I'm going to play with for a moment, right? Ah, we don't need this anymore. So, let's just play. If we can start with the idea of the one, another name for the one hyphen is the good. According to our principles, if there is going to be a progression, a no vacuum, then there must be a similarity between the nature of the one, the one hyphen good, and what follows. 
there must be something so close to it that the qualities of the one proceed to the next. Ah, <laughs> hey, look here. Would you not agree unity is such an idea? Unity, right? Unity. Now, if that's the case, if there is an idea, therefore, that has unity, we can also say, can we not, well, let's, let's have three competing ideas that might be united. All right? Something that has being or existence, vitality or life, and intellect. Now, let me see why I chose those terms. This deserves an explanation. These three are a triune. Being, vitality, intellect. It is said that um, very, very profound mystical experiences, at least one class of such experiences that get people close to the divine or the very source of creation, is the, uh, a divine luminosity permeates all in, in all, in, permeates all, all right, with a transfiguring radiance. That unfolds profoundly the nature of oneself hyphen dash reality. Well, that experience, right, all right, okay. That experience when examined, remember what we said, there's an experience and there's a reflection on it, and you have to develop a vocabulary to try to contain it, to try to preserve it, to try to uh, bring it uh, into, into intellectual communion. Well, it, in that experience one recognizes very clearly that what one is encountering can be said to be akin to the very nature of mind itself, of which we are part and parcel. It's not dead, it has a vast vitality to it, overwhelmingly so. And it shows, does it not, in the very language we're using, reality, therefore we are encountered with a more profound view of the nature of reality, which metaphysically we call that being with a capital B. Now, these three, these three, is a, these are terms created by examining this experience and trying to put words that can grasp, at least in some small measure, the profundity of the experience. Now, remember what we were saying a moment ago. We have to go back to it now, right? And that is the idea of likeness and any idea it's, uh, the idea is more profound to the, the greater extent to which its effects are multiplied beyond another. Right. So, look here. We're going to use these four ideas now. One, two, three, four. Would you agree, in all of our experience, there are many things that show evidence of intellect. Or some degree of evidence. By the way, 
We do not agree, however, that if it does have intellect, it must, of course, be living. And there are many more things that are alive, hyphen vitality, then show evidence of intellect. Oh, by the way, by the very same language, wouldn't you agree? There are many more things that are that have existence than have either life or intellect. Right? There are many more things Oh, by the way, could you not agree by the same logic? There are many more things that have unity. Because some things may not have an existence, they may not have a life, and they may not have an intellect, but they do have a unity. Would you agree, however, that anything that has an intellect necessarily must participate in a unity? And anything that's alive must participate in a unity, and anything that has existence must necessarily participate in a unity. Therefore, the most general term, the most general term is unity. Ah. Therefore, it must necessarily follow that the idea of the one, the highest vision of God, first overflows with the idea of unity and that extends to all multiplicity of things, regardless of what kind it is, because whatever it is, to whatever degree it is, it must have some unity or we wouldn't even describe it and talk about it. Beyond things that have a unity, some things do have being or existence. And then some things not only have a unity, being and existence, they also have life and vitality. Not only that, but some things have uh, unity, Right? They have being, existence, and life, and some have intellect. Therefore, that which has the greater, that which has the greater number of effects is prior and closer to, or similar to, or more similar to its cause. Therefore, that which has the greatest impact through all things must necessarily be closer to its cause and its cause is the one. Therefore, between these two things we can expect the closest similitude. Now look here. Taking that as our point of departure. Okay? Taking that as our point of departure. Oh, let me just make sure we can cover it here. You see? The nearer to the cause the greater the multiplicity or the multitude. Right. One other thing, of course, that the idea of the good, insofar as it gives unity in these qualities, also gives it subsistence or power, same thing. Um, I was going to turn it, but let me wait just one more minute. Now, we also said there's something peculiar about this, and that is not only is there a progression, but there's also a return. Now, that property of returning upon itself, progressing and turning upon itself, is at the very heart of the nature of reality. What is the condition for that? Well, that's a curious question. That means there must be something integral, right, essential and integral about the nature of reality that reality can, does, must have the capacity 
of allowing that return to its cause. That possibility of the return to its cause must be at the heart of reality, and therefore it needs a special word. Ah, who said? Now, I'd like to talk a little about that idea. Okay, let's talk about it first. Now, I'm going here to this idea we've developed about being, vitality, and intellect for a moment. All right, make it a little bigger. Bang. Vitality, intellect. Now, they are not separate things. I put them in this triangle that suggests spatial difference, but these should really be hyphenated. Because if it were separate, we would have that problem we mentioned before. If they're separate, then there'd be no, there'd be no similarity, there'd, there'd be a vacuum, and therefore it'd be discontinuous, and that would violate the idea of progression. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we can talk about, notice now, we can talk about being, since being is not dead, <laughs> being isn't dead, it has a vitality. Vitality isn't just a vitality, it has an existence. Intellect isn't just an intellect floating around, as if it were a mind separated from its sources. Therefore, we can talk about being, the highest expression of being, sometimes called pure being, as being up here call that essence. Essence. And when we talk about pure being, it, it's not dead, so it has a intelligible vitality and it has a intelligible intellect. And here, vitality, equally well, there must be the highest expression of its vitality and therefore it will have a intelligible vitality a vital vitality. See, the same terms can then be exchanged so we can have a similitude operating to dramatize each of these three things so that together you see that one flows into the other as if they were similar colors coming close and shading into the next. Now, notice now, essence is another word for usia. Now, this highest expression of being, usia, has a very interesting metaphysical kind of uh, origin, and I'd like to just talk about that for a moment. Right, because it's a very, very interesting notion. Um, The first two ideas on reflection, the first two ideas, you see, when you talk about unity, you must be talking already about something that's bound. Or talk about unity, by necessity it must be bound. And when you're talking about something that's, that is so close in its similarity or its similitude to the one, and the one is the cause of all creation and therefore a vast and unspeakable power, therefore two ideas appear to be the conditions for unity and there it's infinity and bound. What are these? 
conditions. Well, therefore, unity, therefore, unity, be, must, uh, unity presupposes something coming together in a unity, can't be unity about it. Ah, the bound and infinity coming together produces unity as usia. And anything that mixes must necessarily have three qualities. Must necessarily have three qualities. Any mixture. And therefore, the first mixture, the first idea of unity, right, must by necessity have beauty, truth, and symmetry. For all mixtures have this, any mixture at all can be spoken of in this way. Now, if you see what I'm doing visually, maybe I can help with this now, right? What we've really been talking about is where the, if we can talk about the origin of essence. That's what we've done. By talking about, as it were, the conditions for that being. Therefore, the over in Plotinus now, just to shift the language, Plotinus talks about this as the one or the good necessarily overflowing in abundance, and that abundance is nothing other than this being vitality, intellect, hyphenated. It's an overflowing, right? It's an overflowing for Plotinus. And of course, once it's an overflowing for Plotinus, there's also a return. Now, <clears throat> this experience, this experience, which is what we try to describe here, divine luminosity that permeates all, right? with transfiguring radiance that unfolds profoundly the nature of oneself and reality. When that is experienced, it is always experienced and described independent of culture and time with the terms, good heavens, I have experienced a profound beauty. That turning about, that turning about, we see alike, right? That turning about is built in the very nature of reality. Turning about allows one, therefore, to see the kind of beauty that lies at the very heart of reality, and it's the perfection, and this is sometimes called the perfection of beauty. Now, um, in that experience, the idea of truth means clearly that in it one realizes they are, there is nothing being concealed. It's all open. It's all transparent. Right? It's a transparency. Not that it's, you can see through it, but there is no veil. There's no distortion. And in that sense, it's a transparency. And to that degree, it can be spoken of as truth. Because in this sense, truth means no veil, no hidden aspect. And when one experiences it, one recognizes, therefore, that there's a necessary kinship, see, a very necessary kinship 
a cemetery exists at the very heart of reality between ourselves and the nature of ultimate reality. Similitude. Now, <clears throat> um, Oh, that's not right. Ah, misquoted it. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did, I did. I did. For the one indeed participates being, <clears throat> watch now, I should really put in here, only as an illuminating, truly existing essence. Illuminating, truly existing essence is Usia. But being participates of the one, now in a certain way, notice, as that which is connected by it, connected by it, filled, filled with divine union, and converted to the one itself. But that is imparticipable. So in what way? In this way. Right. For the monads, or the very idea of unity, conjoins in what way? As the intellect conjoins to souls, as the participated intellect conjoins with souls, as our intellect right, conjoins, right, as the intellect conjoins with the soul, and therefore we see through it naturally, and consider it as part of the very vehicle we have for being, so too, so too, souls conjoin to our bodies, right? And souls conjoins body to souls. In what way is that? As a whole, a whole in which they are no apparent differences. Like, what is, what is health? Health is when you're no longer concerned with the body. You just see through it. When intellect is joined to the soul, well, you just that's the way you see things. As a whole. As a unity. Right? <clears throat> so I thought I would... By the way, it would follow, would it not, by uh, the same logic of similitude, that it necessarily follows if there's a good, there must be goodness. There is one, there must be unity. Right? If there is unity, there must be union. If there is union, there must be communion. Right? If there is union, therefore there must be units. Right? There's a whole language that can follow from each side. Whole 
good, goodness, wholeness. And if there's a process going on, perfecting, returning. I, I uh, should have said that earlier, but I just wanted to pull it in quick. And I have one nice quote I'd like to read to you. Since there is one unity, the principle of the whole of things, and from which every hyparxis, which is a natural flowering, derives its subsistence, that this unity should produce from itself, prior to all other things, a multitude characterized by unity. and a number allied, most allied to its cause. For if, if every other cause constitutes a progeny, progeny similar to itself, prior to that which is dissimilar, much more must the one unfold into light after this matter, after this manner, things posterior to itself, after itself. Since it itself is beyond similitude, and the one itself must produce according to union things which primarily proceed from it. The one, therefore, is the cause of the whole of things according to union, and the progression from the one is uniform. But if that which primarily produces all things is the one, and the progression from it is unical, and unions, it is, it is certainly necessary that the multitude hence produced should be self-perfect unities most allied to their producing cause. All right. Therefore, this unity is going to be most like its producing cause, the one. And therefore, it must therefore necessarily have a similar to it. Now, let's see if we can then push one more step and pull it together on another level. <clears throat> Similar to means there's, there, there must be things in the same class. Also means that they're between two things. If they join, there must be that which is a mean between them. Therefore, if there are two things that can combine, Therefore, would you not agree we can say A is to B as B is to C? We wouldn't make any difference if we turned it around conversely and said B is to A is C is to B. We can express similes, similes, similitude similes by taking terms alternately. And convert them. Therefore, we have a transformation of a basic mean, a mean between two extremes, represented in this way. Now look what we have. One, two, three, four. We have the second term, B, that can be found in every place, twice. B, 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 B. 
and fits in a very nice oval. We can have the first set of relationships, A is to B, and its converse. And we can have the second and its converse. And we can contrast them by switching them here. Notice they can be switched here. Notice then that the extreme terms, A and C, can move from the extreme to the middle, or the mean, Notice, therefore, that A, B, B, C, taken backwards, is C, B, B, A. C, B, B, A is the same as B, C, B, A. A, B, C is the same as taking it vertically, A, B, C. B, A, C, B is backwards, B, C, A, B, or taking it the other way. B, A, C, B, B, A, C, B is the same as going up, B, A, C, B. Would you not agree, therefore, that here in a mean analogy based upon three terms just like we have here, that we have an amazing way of representing a beautiful similarity, ordered, structured, and the four ways in which you can represent a mean analogy. And therefore, we have three terms being brought together into a unity in which each turn can be shown to show itself up in each place and each row twice, containing a unity, an internal unity, a movement of balance and proportion on both sides. And therefore, this is why Plato calls this first progression, which is nothing other than usia, to be the most beautiful of all possible analogies, the very condition of beauty itself. Therefore, we've dealt with similitude, showed it analogically, to explore the idea of essence and usia for this evening. Thank you. Yeah. So, if that's the most beautiful analogy, what are the three terms? Are those beauty, symmetry, and truth? Is that...? The three terms are here, bound, uh, infinity, and essence. Um, or A, B, C. Pardon me, I, ch I changed the terms then, A, B, C. B is the middle term. Sir? You can use other terms for that. You can use other terms for that. If I understand you correctly, yes, many things, so long as they can be placed in classes where that property exists, yes. 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 You can put grandparents are to your parents as your parents are to you. That's a natural mean analogy. Right, showing a progression. And isn't it likely that that kind of pro progression has no vacuum, no uh, missing terms? For certainly without your parents, you wouldn't be. I think we can find total agreement to that possibility. Yeah. Sir. One good and unity, yeah. Broken down into uh, the being, the intellect, and the. Uh, yes, yes. What, what I didn't understand is in order to uh, see it, you create that, that, that intersection which was infinitely extended and finitely bound, and that was that if something's finite, if something's infinitely extended but finitely bound, that would be a unity, it would be truth, and it would be beautiful. But why is it only a being essence? Why is it all? Why did I restrict it to being? Well, well, um, okay. <clears throat> it, let, let's change that word. Watch.
Uh, this really starts with the, the notion of uh, what possibly could be uh, what possi possibly be the first the first creation and what if possibly can we talk about the conditions for that first creation um, Infinite and finite. Well, bond, yes. That's where I'm going. Yeah, yeah, that's where we're going. Um, you see, the difficulty in doing metaphysics with a theological language is that the terms cannot be generated on the basis of similarity. Right? God, um, godliness, uh, look, one, there's a whole set of terms that we can show have a certain declension, as it were, from one. Well, the closest to one, we can say, is union. But union already presupposes unity, so unity, union, communion, whole, right, we can, we, wholeness. We can get a whole bunch of things, can't we? Now, the degree to which these, the, the degree to which these can be ordered in the way in which you can talk about their progression or declension, right, based upon the principle of similarity or similitude, right, whatever that is. Now, Plato is going to, pardon me? Are you then, um, when, you're, when you're breaking up unity into being, intellect, and vitality, are you giving me a primacy over the other two? Later. Okay. Not, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. So, uh, the closest similitude to the one is not being but one, but unity. Okay. Huh? So therefore, uh, if there is this thing called unity, that creation, that creation, there must be something we can talk about that is most similar to the conditions for creation and the idea of unity. Right. Well, Unity itself presupposes that it's already circumscribed, bound, presupposes bound. Right. But the closest thing of unity to, to the one, right, the one as a, as a creative uh, must, ha must, must be vast, Infant, infant. The that's where being comes in. Right there. That that unity of these two prior conditions is the very cause of the existence of a pure being. This pure being takes on different terms, but the key term in uh, Proclus especially is usia, or uh, um, what, how do they call, talk about it? Uh, truly, truly existing essence. 
Yeah, I should put that down. Truly existing essence. But, see, in English, the word essence doesn't have any recursive power to it. You can't derive it from that idea. So, so being human existence and vitality is just like follow? Yeah, now you can talk about what properties must be in a pure being. Right, right, okay. So that's how it's generated. Yeah, okay. Hi. Um, when you were talking about there's not only a progression but also a return. Yes. You made, um, I think you asked the question, what is the condition for that? And then the statement that there must be something integral about reality that it has to have a returning. That's the way I took it. And that, that transition, I really didn't see if you were showing how the nature of reality is such that it has that there's that there's a necessity for reversion or for you see a likeness. You see that? If there were no return, then by necessity, then by necessity, then there would be no desire on the part of participants to discover their cause. Would you agree with that? I think so. All right. If there would be no desire on the part of participants to return to their cause, there would be no sympathy right, or any interest in any communication with its source. Fair enough. Right, 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 right. Now, if there would be no desire on the part of the participants, then by necessity, according to this logic, then its cause could not be seen or regarded as beauty itself. And more beautiful than it than those that have a desire. But desire for beauty is inherent in anything that, that has an intellect. Right? And there is always a sympathy between a cause and its progeny or its result. Right? So therefore, there's a natural sympathy in the universe for a, a progression and a desire to communicate and to return to its source. For if it were not the case, then there would be no reason to assert that it is beauty in itself and the experience of beauty in itself or discovering the fact that man does have a source beyond his biological nature and therefore there would be no necessary sympathy between man and his cause or the cause in man. Therefore, there would be no dissent as they call it of goodness for the image of goodness presupposes all things, if there is any goodness, there is a perfecting. And a perfecting must be as a result of a basic Lucia-like return, because the return always presupposes a return to a more profound level than the level upon which it desires. Desire is always unfulfilled. To find it fulfilled, one has to, one has to enter into a different way of being to participate with the object of one's desire. Right? And therefore, one has to emerge out of one's isolation and move, etc., and go through the need for sympathy, communication, and desire. Equally well, you see, when you have, you can go back this way too. One good, not just one. See, the idea of good means necessarily there must be a goodness. If there's a goodness, then there must be a sharing between its cause and the goodness which it bestows on its creation. And one of the marks of the goodness of a creation is that it has the possibility of returning to, to recognize and participate in its source, which it would recognize in a higher and more profound level than its own existence. Therefore, Usia is built into the very nature of reality, 
such that its return is accompanied with visions of beauty and splendor, necessarily, which is a higher level. Uh, methodology question. Mm -hmm. you say I'm meditating and I'm concentrating my awareness, then I drop back and I'm aware of my awareness. Is that awareness that's aware of my awareness, is that the infinite trying to come down into my final awareness? If I am aware of my awareness, it wouldn't be mine. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Therefore, if I am aware of awareness, then I've reached behind aware to discover the very nature of its being. That's on another level than my awareness, because that's saying, my awareness is saying, there's a property of awareness that I possess. And therefore, one cannot really say, I am aware of my awareness. Because the, this language is inappropriate. Isn't awareness aware aware? <laughs> no, 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 no. Can't get, can't get there for, for the same reason. Well, so let's say I can really super step up my awareness, and I drop it. Well, well, why do you say it's your awareness? Well, I'm just playing with that. No, no. If you mean it, if, if, you, if it's simply a way of communicating language, I won't pay attention to it. And I'll just take it as a mode of language. But if you mean to assert ownership, I have to ask you whether you intend that or not. Well, I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Therefore? I don't know. Well, that's why I'm asking the question, because there is awareness that's aware of my awareness. Uh, <laughs> If there is an awareness that is aware of your awareness? I guess it's still my awareness of my awareness, but it's okay. still possession. Because then what you would have to have in this game is what would count as evidence or an experience that you possess awareness, such that you could call it my awareness. Okay, I can do that. Right. If you can't back if you can't supply that then the language makes sense grammatically, but not metaphysically or experientially. Okay, I can supply evidence I'm aware of something, and then I, if I can supply evidence, I can drop back and see myself being aware of that. Yeah, but that is not the same thing as being aware of awareness. You are dropping back and reflecting on it. Yeah. Well, that's different than being, right. that's a reflection on awareness, it's different than experience of awareness being aware. Right, we're, we're following. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I was, I was trying to figure out how to become, you know, a, a being. I, I thought that awareness was the awareness of my, my God self or something. I'm trying to bring it into my finances. Oh, okay, okay. Then the, that's really, a, you know, a very significant thing to do. The question then is to see if there's a me. Because in this game, in this kind of an experience, there's no room for me. Because that's a duality. And that a duality means an otherness. Duality means a strangeness. No matter how much a kinship there might be, there's still the recognition. No. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the concept of usia being beings? Beings? Usia being beingness. How does that? Okay, watch. Mm. Um, if you would change this and say, Usia being a pure being, then I can do it. But not if you ask or see a being, beingness. Because beingness would be what is common to these three. 
that's beingness. Usia being a pure being in our example would be, right, taking this as our example, right, the highest, purest sense of being is usia. <clears throat> and usia being a pure being would be to say that the fullest expression, the most beautiful expression, the fullest flowering of being is usia. Is a quality of looking up, turning on the sun. Yes, that is the fullest flowering of being. This is a, they call that hyparxis. This is as high as it goes. Yeah. 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 They call what hyparxis? Hyparxis, yeah. Hyparxis meaning? The fullest flowering, the fullest unfolding and flowering of that which has the potentiality for emerging on higher levels. Good. Well, I don't see how I don't see how desire and beauty are linked. When you said oh, that's that. easy. Have you ever been bored by beauty? No. What happens the more you encounter something, more and more beautiful? What does it do to you? It arouses me. Oh, I don't know what the word means. Yeah. Uh, what does arouse me? Excited. Vital. Oh. But, What's another word for it? Um, does it want to rouse to something? To yeah, you? that would, yeah, yeah. 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 What? It's a rouse to something? To for something? To, for something? To, for to something? To have it, to participate in it, to. But you wouldn't want to call that a desire for it, would you? Yes, I would. Oh, what was your question again? <laughs> okay. I understand that, that the presence of beauty causes desire, but the way you said it before, you said, if no desire, then no beauty itself. No experience of. No, no experience of. Okay, this brings our Tuesday night series to a conclusion. And thank you for letting me explore these ideas. I had some more quotes, but it's nine o'clock. And uh, I enjoyed it. Thank you for coming. Thank you.